We're all very much aware now of the need to find new sources of energy. But in a country like Britain, could we use the sun to replace our conventional sources of power? We go now to Nottingham and the team from the Frank Weldon School. This power station is the largest in Europe. It produces one-fifth of all Britain's electricity, but it burns 38,000 tonnes of coal a day. Most of that energy is wasted. What are the alternatives? Oil is running out. We all know that nuclear power is dangerous. We're working on energy from the sun. Critics say that solar energy is no good, but we're working on a new form of cell which we believe holds great prospects for the future. Just relax. You've got a lovely smile, so let's see. All right. Okay, Wendy. I'll just take a reading of the face now. All right. That's fine, Tony. Okay. All right, we're ready. Okay, mark it. Solar cells, 50, take one. Cue Wendy. This light meter, which Mike has just used to take this reading of me, works on the same principle as a solar cell. There's a piece of metal inside it, which when light shines on it, makes the needle move. This is the normal solar cell, made of silicon, but it's very, very expensive. It costs £90 to produce one watt of electricity. This is our solar cell. It's a lot smaller, but we expect to be able to produce energy at a cost of one pound per watt. The principle of our solar cell is a sandwich between two chemicals. Cadmium sulphide on the bottom, copper sulphide on the top. When these are fused together, they encourage electrons to pass from one to the other and an electricity is produced. First of all, we have to get a layer of cadmium on a small piece of glass. The first method we used for doing this was painting, but that didn't work very well as it produced a very uneven coating on the glass. The second method is to put it in a molten bath of hot lead and spray it in short, sharp bursts. This produces a good, even layer. The cell now has its layer of cadmium, but still needs its layer of copper. This is done in the plating bath. First of all, the cell is dipped in acid to clean it. Then into water to wash off the acid. Off, In the plating bath there are copper ions which knock off the top surface of the cadmium. So it isn't left in for too long otherwise all the cadmium is removed. Afterwards the copper turns the surface black. The cell is now almost finished. After half an hour in the oven, it's finally ready for testing. The artificial sun, in this case, is a 60-watt bulb shone directly onto the cell. As contacts are lowered onto the cell's surface, the moment of truth approaches. Using this setup, we can find the voltage and the current produced by our newly made cell. With calculations, we can then find the efficiency of the cell. At the moment, we're getting cells which are about 1% efficient, but with modifications to the process, we can aim for a target of 5%, which will make them viable for mass production. Even with our present efficiency, if we were to cover the roof of this car van with our cells, we could produce enough electricity for anything that anybody could possibly want inside. We have 100 watts. This could be used to power a fridge, a television. Packs and baby cans. This only uses 60 watts. And of course, a light. 15 watts. This is just the start. Further development, we can increase the efficiency threefold. This would be very useful in third world countries, where there is lots of sun, but very little money. The Nottingham team are Wendy Streeter, David McLaughlin, James Cross and Robert Silver. And the first question from Mary Archer. 
Wendy, the efficiency of your cell is about 1%. Other people have succeeded in making cadmium sulfide cells up to about 8% efficient. Um, why do you think yours does less well in this respect? Well, the commercially produced cells use complicated equipment, expensive equipment, so the results are far more accurate than ours. We only use simple equipment. Also, for our cell, we only use a point contact, which only draws off a small amount of the current. With a grid cr contact, we could probably draw off quite a bit more and probably at least double the efficiency of our cells. David, your cells are rather small at present. Uh, is it possible to make them larger using your technique? Um, if our process ever gets to a mass production scale, yes, it will be. We'll be able to spray cadmium sulphide onto almost any size of area of glass or plastic. What do you see as the major problem in putting them into mass production? Well, there's no major problem, really. It will just be a question of getting the glass up to a right, um, the temperature temperature of 340 degrees centigrade and then on the plating bath side having a big enough bath to be able to drop the cadmium sulfide coated glass into the bath. So you propose to continue to plate even at larger sizes? Mm. Robert, um, silicon cells, although they're very expensive to manufacture, are quite widely used. So what's the big advantage of the silicon uh, solar cell that um, compensates for the additional cost? Well, the silicon, <coughs> the silicon cells are very efficient. They're up to 25% efficient. This means you don't need, if you say you want 20 watts, you don't need a very large area. But with our cadmium sulfide cells, although they're a lot cheaper to produce, you need quite a large area to produce 20 And why is there the area of the cell important in solar cell application? Well, uh, largely the area, the more space it takes up, and in some cases there may be a limited amount of space available. Yes. James, it's important for the operation of this cell that the cadmium sulphide layer is N-type and contains mobile electrons, and the cuprous sulphide layer is P-type and contains mobile holes. Do you know why there is this difference between the two materials? Well, there must be a difference between the materials, so you get a movement of electrons from the P-type to the N-type. But what makes cadmium sulphide N-type and cuprous sulphide P-type? Well, it's the chemical structure of the uh, chemicals we use. Um, one, one last question, um, Wendy. Solar cells only produce electricity when the sun shines on them. What other component would you need in a system to assure you of continuous supply? Well, obviously, you've got to have some method of storing the energy. So, um, light shines on the devices during the day. You then tap that off to a battery of some sort, store it so that it can be used at night. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy, David, James, Robert. Now, we must just give the judges a moment, finally, to make up their minds. Though, let me again emphasise that they have been thinking about it all day. They've been talking to the teams, looking at the films, examining their detailed project notes. But now, they must pick just one to go through to our final. Already there are the team from Brinalin School, Wrexham, with their research into bumblebees, and the team from Bexhill College, who've been doing their work on absent-mindedness. And can I also remind you that apart from our usual handsome trophy from the Royal Institution, we have some other prizes this year from New Scientist magazine, from the Institute of Biology, and from the Institute of Measurement and Control. But now we must, as it were, come to the final act of this week's drama. So, uh, Ken Wallace, tell us first of all what you thought of the stage lighting for Newcastle. Uh, this is a most interesting application of a very modern technology, the microprocessor, in a traditional field, the live theatre. In the end, a, a design project must be judged by whether it works or not. And Graham and Anthony have built a working system which both improves the control of lighting systems and makes them considerably safer. There were many difficult problems to be tackled and they solved these in a most impressive way. I really do feel they understand how their system works. Colin Blakemore, uh, Jeremy Scourchley, I think far and away the youngest competitor we've ever had on the programme. Yes, of course, we were very impressed with the way in which uh, someone as young as Jeremy has uh, acquired such an extensive knowledge of the history and the principles of light bulbs. He really is remarkably well informed, a real authority on, on lamps. Uh, he's also tackled an interesting design problem, the remote powering of lamps, which might have more important applications than just eliminating the unsightly break in circular uh, neon tubes. 
His research hasn't produced a final product yet, but he's obviously got a lot of time to solve all those problems. Mary Archer, what did you think of the efficiency of the solar cells and, of course, the science behind them? Well, the low efficiency is a problem. The cadmium sulphide cell has been with us for some years now, and what the team have started by doing, quite sensibly, is to repeat standard methods of fabrication. And now they have to go on and put in something original. Now, they started to do this with their nice work on um, investigation of how the cuprous sulphide layer grows in the plating bath and the influence of the plating potential. And if they can improve the efficiency of their device by closer process control or, or by modifying the chemical constitution of the cells, then they'll have a really interesting device. Right, thank you very much. So, tell us, Colin, how the marks have been awarded this week. Well, first to Graham and Anthony from Newcastle for their very clever application of computing techniques to the control of theatre lights, we gave 71 marks. Next, for his broad study of lighting systems and his promising attempts to make a new kind of ring lamp, we awarded Jeremy Skirchley from Ravensdale School 60 marks. And finally, to the team from Frank Weldon School for their efforts to improve the cadmium sulphide solar cell, we gave 52 marks. Our winners this week are the Royal Grammar School, Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Our congratulations to them, commiserations to the runners-up. Until the same time next week, goodbye.